Dolly, tell me about your relationship with Dolly and how that partnership started and all of that. Well, it, I think it was a God thing. Uh, her bus driver lived in Blue Line, Missouri, and he knew Silver Dollar City really well. And he kept t telling Dolly Parton that she needed to visit Silver Dollar City, and she did. She would dress herself down and wear uh, not her normal wigs, but another wig, and, and bind herself up some, and, and she could come to Silver Dollar City and not be recognized. So she really discovered us through her bus driver more than we discovered her. And then in 76, we went to the Smoky Mountains to build what was then Silver Dollar City, Tennessee, and never thought about a partnership with the other partner. But she announced in 1975 that she was going to build a theme park. Mm -hmm. And we said, no, oh, that's, that's not going to be good. So that's when we approached her to go into a partnership with her. And it's been a wonderful, wonderful relationship. And what you haven't had to ask is, Dolly Parton uh, is going to be as near the perfect partner as you could ever find. She understands what the guest wants better than about anybody I know. And I don't know how she does it. I get a chance to go out on the park and I can ask people what they like and they don't like. She'd be mobbed if she did that. But somehow she's got a sense of what people want and, uh, and then contractually what she's obligated to do, she does three times that. She's mm -hmm. just all, without being asked, she just, an amazing, amazing partner. Your attractions that you got in the park, I know Disney has their Imagineering, WED Enterprises and all of that. How, how did you guys start out doing that? And are the attractions still done in some central location? Or are they done on the park level? Or how does that all work out? Well, in recent years, uh, uh, our, our most recent attractions have been purchased by uh, Ryan Manufacturers. Uh, in, in the early years, uh, we built everything ourselves. So uh, the steam train we bought from uh, Henry Ford in upstate New York, and, but we laid the track and we repaired the engine so it would make it up the Ozark Hills and, and uh, uh, fire in the hole and uh, uh, d different attractions, Rue Duke and Stuyvesant one. Incidentally, that one, which is no longer in the park, uh, Disney engineers came to see how we did it, and they copied it. So that was a that was a form of flattery to see Disney copying us. So, so early on, um, we would get a group of folks that had no engineering background, very little formal education, and we'd get around our lunch buckets and say, how could we do this? And uh, they were incredible, incredible people in figuring out how we could uh, how we could do something that was different. We tried to strive very hard to build rides and attractions and shows that would not be the same as other theme parks. And some of yours that you've got, like the fire in the hole and the flooded mine, are kind of the dark rides, as they call them, kind of like. Pirates of the Caribbean, or whatever. Like, are those more are those more difficult to build, more expensive, or how does that? Well, they they were they were expensive at the time. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me, they were expensive at the time, but uh, in today's cost of roller coasters, they were relatively inexpensive. How many of the younger Hershians have gotten involved into the theme park business with you guys? I think each of you and your brother both have one son that's involved in some aspect of it. Uh, I don't have any. I have that? three sons, and they all do things outside of the business. Mm -hmm. And uh, my brother Pete has five children, mm -hmm. and only one oh, okay. of his children are in the business. He lives in Atlanta. Okay. One of them was in charge of the cave business at one time. Is that the same one? I think somebody mentioned it. It was my right. youngest son, Bruce. Okay. <coughs> I'm sorry mm -hmm. for the cough. Thank you. Good, Thank you, man. Where did that came from? I 
Why before the interview? <laughs> I didn't cough till I saw Lisa. <laughs> When it comes to uh, entry into all I'd like for him to talk about the, his love of the cave and okay. Bruce and the son. You're, both your sons are doing caves. And Jack's hobby is caving, too. We, uh, two of my three sons are in the cave business. Uh, the oldest son, Jim, owns an enormous cave in central Tennessee, south of Nashville, um, and, and uh, 27 miles of cave. And uh, called Cumberland Caverns, and my youngest son uh, uh, operates Talking Rocks, just uh, just down the road from here. So uh, both of them continue to be in the cave business, but they're their own boss, and they get a chance to do their own thing rather than live in their father's shadow. And, and so I think they're much happier being outside the business. Uh, you change from being a single uh, single park location and all. Hirsch and Entertainment now owns about how many different things? About twenty one different. Something like that. A, a whole group of them. I can see where that would have changed things a good bit. It it has uh, the uh, the main driver for that growth really is in finding the world's best leadership and then keep it. Mm -hmm. And if you're stagnant, you're not growing, uh, you don't provide the challenge that the, the world's best leaders are looking for. So it's really been an answer to the challenge of uh, finding and retaining great leaders that, that we've grown. Mm -hmm. When it comes to the expansion into those different parks and attractions, how much of that was planned ahead and how much of it is opportunistic? Like you see an opportunity and then... It's a combination of both. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the part that's planned is to say, we plan to go look to see what other opportunities uh, are out there. And then almost always the actual new uh, property is opportunistic. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's just came about at the right time, and uh, uh, he, the two aquariums come to my mind. Uh, we were looking, but we weren't looking for aquariums at all, and uh, and we found uh, that we could be in in, in a business that had a roof over it. We thought we ought to try that. That's, that's <laughs> I would add uh, just for the record, that we haven't always been successful. I get to drive by Celebration City every day that I come to Silver Dollar City, and, and uh, that was one where we did not succeed. And, uh, we, we do a post-mortem when we have a failure, and, and, uh, and we learn from, from that. Uh, but in the, case, in the case of Celebration City, Really, the, the root cause of the problem was arrogance. That we, that we felt that because we were, had been successful at Silver Dollar City, we could replicate it. And we looked at uh, Orlando and what Disney World has done in building several parks. And we thought, well, if we build a second, people will stay longer and community will prosper more. And we, we thought it was a win-win for everybody. We were wrong. We didn't do sufficient homework. Uh, so. We've had successes, but uh, we are fallible. We've had some big blunders as well. In the Grand Palace Theater, I think you'd also mentioned one. Another blunder. We thought that with the uh, expansion of the the music business, that there was room there was room for a theater that was approximately twice the size of the other theaters so that we could bring in bigger names and that that would be good for the music industry to, to have the Reba McIntyre's and the Vince Gills play in Branson. And they couldn't play in a 2000 seat theater. So that was the logic behind it. And it worked for a year. And 
uh, Reed McIntyre, I remember the figures on, on her, she charges uh, $75,000 to do two shows in, in our first year. And we made some money. Mm -hmm. The next year, she charged $125,000 to do one show. And we didn't even have money from popcorn sales left. So uh, the, the stars that we thought we were going to bring and could afford up their prices, and, and so we, we failed. Okay. And now that you uh, have both the corporate level and the park level, how are those duties divided up when it comes to the attractions, the acts, and all of that kind of thing? How much of that's decided by corporate, and how much is that? Well, in the case of Silver Dollar City, how much of that's decided here in Branson? Another great question. The, uh, the need is uh, generated locally. And many times, the most creative of the ideas come locally. Uh, what corporate does is it it will add additional options uh, for for the leadership team locally to decide the, the decisions on what's to be added or made locally. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, the Atlanta office adds options, and then they add expertise that we can use over and over in different pro properties. So uh, it, it's a it's a interesting combination that you kind of wonder if it worked, but it works very very well. And why Atlanta? I thought you know that was interesting. It seems like Memphis or yeah, Nashville would have been more central to the locations where you are now. It would. Uh, when uh, I I look to uh, step down, uh, we. Uh, did not have anybody on the board that we that I felt would make a good chairman. So we went out hunting for uh, we hired a Christian search firm mm -hmm. to find us a, a man of faith that would be our next leader. And uh, when we found him, uh, he came on board uh, on the board of directors, and he didn't know it, but we were watching him to become chairman. <laughs> And then when the opening came uh, for we needed a CEO, I asked Joel Mandy if he would uh, if he would accept the CEO position. And his only hesitation was his family, four four daughters, wife, wife all loved Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And I said, if you'll come, we'll move the headquarters to Atlanta. Okay, it was to. <laughs> get the right leadership, and, and it has proved we got the right leader. Mm -hmm. he's, a, he's an incredible, incredible leader. Which the Undercover Boss episode kind of highlighted that to the country. And, and then if you get a chance to read his book, Love, Love Works, it's a highly creative mm -hmm. idea. Have, have you I heard, have read that one. Oh, have you? And I saw his description <laughs> of your retirement in there. Well, just the idea of taking First Corinthians right. 13 and applying it to, to leadership, I thought, was very yeah, creative. Yeah, using that as the chapters as his framework. Yeah. Was. yeah. I did buy that one, quoted a few things from it. Okay. I was trying to think if there were any other things on my list, but that's pretty much all uh, he's asked or I've asked. <laughs> Okay. And I just have some, because I've never asked it, and when you ask about the caving, <laughs> you can look at Tim. But, um, you know, it's almost an obsession that you have with the caving. What, what, you know, a lot of us have a little, I mean, you took me once about underneath and over and on my stomach, and I mean, I still think about it late at night sometimes and say, what was I thinking? What's the deal with caving? What do you... Well, I'm a little guy. I love taking bigger people into tight spots and seeing them squirm. It's, it's kind of my get even time. I, I thoroughly enjoy it. That's not really true. Uh, I, uh, as a teenager, my brother and I came to Marble Cave and we didn't know any other kids in high school that had a cave they could play in. And, and we were just beside ourselves with joy that we had this incredible, incredible fun place uh, to explore. 
And, and I think it was the joy that we found in, in those early years as teenagers exploring that, that led us to um, caves around the world. Uh, and and uh, it just, it's a very satisfying experience when you can visit some place that nobody else has ever seen. That's a, that's a thrill. Okay, what's the best part of all of it? The whole last six decades. The best part? Boy, that's, never been asked that. Uh, this is going to sound like I'm answering it the way you would want me to answer it, but I'm going to be as truthful as I know how. So. I apologize in advance that it sounds, it sounds. I really think that the biggest thrill for me is, is to see the growth in the people that make their organization successful. That, that uh, for an old white-haired guy, there's just nothing that is more satisfying than seeing people come up from within and uh, reach their potential in terms of leaders or cooks or basket makers or whatever and the pride step inside the glass shop and just see the tremendous pride that they have in, in what they do that's that's payday for me I love seeing that uh, opportunity for folks to uh, do more and learn more and be more Cheryl, anybody? Thank you very much. All set? Okay, cool. Portland, I guess we're okay. Guys, thank you.